Hi guys, and welcome to this virtual lecture course on quantum condensed matter physics. I'm Dr. Andrew Mitchell, and in this lecture we'll be studying simple models for systems involving fermions. This lecture will be building upon the second quantized formalism that we developed in the previous lectures. In the first part of the lecture, we will discuss a paradigmatic model for quantum fermionic systems called the free electron gas. Here we imagine that we have a bunch of different quantum orbitals and we have quantum particles, fermions, specifically electrons, which can occupy these different orbitals. But the electrons do not interact with each other. They simply occupy or do not occupy these different orbitals, which can be held at different energies. This is basically a quantum gas. It's an important system and from it we can derive, for example, the Fermi-Dirac distribution function. And we'll be doing that in this lecture. In the second quantized formulation, um, we can write down basis states in the occupation number basis. This basically tells us how many electrons are occupying each of these quantum orbitals. In this case of the free electron gas, we'll see that these product state basis states um, in the occupation basis are actually the exact eigenstates of that Hamiltonian. We can therefore trivially read off the energy of the, the full system by just knowing um, the energies of the individual orbitals and how many electrons, either zero or one, occupy each of these orbitals. In the second part of the lecture, we'll come on to study a more sophisticated class of models that more closely reflects um, real systems. These are a category of models called tight binding models. These are still models in which, the, in which the electrons do not interact with each other through the Coulomb interaction. We assume that's been shielded or screened away. But we do allow the electrons to move from one orbital to another. The electrons can quantum mechanically tunnel from one quantum orbital to another. And of course, this means the eigenstates are going to be superpositions of the product state basis involving electrons in specific orbitals. This is because under the quantum mechanic or uh, tunneling operator, the electrons can move from one place to another. So the eigenstates will of course be superpositions of uh, the states where the electrons are in specific posi positions. We'll uncover the basic problems um, that need to be tackled in, uh, in this lecture to do with tight binding models, and we'll leave that for a future lecture to actually solve the Schrodinger equation for that more complicated set of systems. And uh, that will be a lecture in which we understand how to solve the Schrodinger equation for quantum many-body systems through the tight binding uh, formalism and using second quantization. In this lecture, we're just going to take a look at these fundamental models and see what kind of physics we can expect from them. So let's get down to work. So what I want to talk about now are some model Hamiltonians, which describe certain simple systems. And in this first part, the model Hamiltonians that we'll consider will be um, non-interacting fermionic systems. Um, we'll see that these non-interacting fermionic systems are already very interesting and contain a rich range of physics, describing, for example, uh, metals and band insulators, and can even have more exotic things like topological insulators and superconductors, all within this effective non-interacting description. Uh, later on, we'll look at putting the Coulomb interaction between the electrons in, and we'll see that that makes things a bit more difficult. So for now, we're just going to consider these model Hamiltonians describing certain systems um, and we're going to consider non-interacting systems. And I'll explain precisely what it means for a system to be non-interacting in a, in, in a precise and quantitative way uh, in a moment. So I want to, uh, today to talk about two different classes of systems. Um, the first is the so-called free electron gas. And... Um, uh, the second are a class of models called tight binding models. It, uh, later on, what I want to show you is that you can transform uh, any non-interacting fermionic model 
into this free electron gas using a suitable basis transformation, which is called a canonical transformation. And indeed, solving uh, many body quantum systems is basically equivalent to performing such a transformation. Uh, finding out how to do that and actually doing it in practice uh, might be complicated. In some uh, useful situations, it turns out it's rather simple to do that, and we'll study all of those cases in detail. Okay, but first of all, let's look at this non this uh, free electron gas. The idea is it's the sort of simplest model that we can write down for free fermions, free fermions meaning non-interacting, and um, what we imagine is that there are electrons that can occupy quantum state uh, K. So electrons can occupy these quantum states K. And so we can write down a Hamiltonian operator for this system, which involves the sum over all of these uh, k state orbitals. Let me just write down the Hamiltonian, then we can discuss it a little bit. Okay, so first of all, what are these um, quantum states K that I've mentioned? Well, what we mean by this is that we have uh, quantum orbitals uh, labeled by K, and they can either be uh, empty or full. So this NK can be either zero or one only because we're talking about fermions. So that's what I mean by this ket k here. There's some orbital labeled by k with occupation number nk. And from the previous discussion, we know that the number operator nk hat acting on our state k um, gives us the number of electrons in that state uh, nk times the state k back again. Okay, so let's return now to our Hamiltonian. Um, we can see from this Hamiltonian that this thing epsilon k is a is the single particle energy of state k. So this is like a potential energy for a particular orbital. It tells you what is the energy of that orbital. If there is an electron in that orbital, it has an energy epsilon k. If there is no electron in that orbital, then it has no contribution to the total energy. So this is really a potential energy. Of uh, orbital. OK. That's what this single particle energy means. And the total energy of the system is obtained just by adding up all the energies of all the individual particles. It depends how many particles I have in my system, what the total energy is, and how they're distributed. The lowest energy state of the system, which we call the ground state, would be one for a given number of electrons that occupy um, the lowest energy uh, states the epsilon k with uh, the most negative values, let's say. Um, if I were to have a total, uh, a, a, the vacuum state with a total electron number equals to zero, then the energy would obviously be equal to zero, but the energy might be lowered by putting electrons into orbitals that have uh, negative energies. So what are the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian? Well, actually, it turns out the eigenstates are extremely simple because um, the Hamiltonian commutes with all of these nk operators, which means that the nk's are conserved quantities, so the set of these nk's are conserved by the Hamiltonian, 
and therefore they're good quantum numbers. To describe the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian. In turn, what that means is that the states, the occupation number basis states that we wrote down uh, earlier in this lecture, are actually eigenstates of this Hamiltonian. So imagine that I label my states k, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, up to n m, let's call it. There are m orbitals in our system. Um, then this is going to give us, as an energy, some energy of this state. Um, let's label this energy according to the occupation number, n1, n2, n3, and so on, all the way up to n m, times the state back again. where uh, we can write down explicitly the energy of this state. And this is just the sum of the occupation numbers multiplied by the single particle energies. So the total energy of a state is obtained just by asking what is the occupation of a, a given orbital, multiply that by the energy of that orbital, and then sum it up for all orbitals. So that's rather straightforward. These states are eigenstates in the Hamiltonian precisely because the Hamiltonian is just a sum of the number operators and that we know that these states are eigenstates of the number operators. That's what we proved in the last uh, section. So indeed, these uh, occupation number basis states are eigenstates of this particular Hamiltonian. We would say that it's a diagonal representation because the basis states uh, are diagonal. They don't talk to each other under the Hamiltonian. We'll see in more complicated models that maybe you act on uh, with the Hamiltonian on a particular basis state and it gives you as the result of that, a linear combination of other basis states, so they're not themselves eigenstates. In that case, we need to diagonalize the Hamiltonian to find the actual eigenstates. So now I want to talk about the Fermi-Dirac distribution, which we can obtain from a description of the free electron gas that we just described. First of all, consider what happens at zero temperature. At zero temperature, only the ground state of our Hamiltonian um, is thermally occupied. Only the ground state has statistical weight. So a question here might be, what is the ground state? The ground state is just the state with the lowest energy. So imagine that we have a state, let's call it psi zero, with corresponding energy uh, E zero. The ground state is the one where this uh, E zero is smaller than any other energies. So this is the minimum many particle energy. Now, we can actually ask this question for different numbers of electrons. Uh, we could say, what's the minimum energy state with n electrons? What's the minimum energy state for n plus 1 electrons? And so on. Or we could say, what is the minimum energy state with any number of electrons? If I have no electrons in the system at all, the energy is equal to zero. But if my epsilon k's are negative, which just means an energy um, less than zero with respect to our given uh, uh, zero energy origin, 
um, then those states will be low in energy and those things would be uh, favoured at low energies. The minimum one of which, looking across all different n, would be our overall ground state. So um, at t equals zero, only the ground state is statistically occupied. Uh, but at finite temperature, we have a statistical mixture. of uh, the various states. So the occupation of these many particle states uh, fluctuates. Uh, the occupation number of these things fluctuates rather than being fixed to either zero or one. And in statistical mechanics, um, we can describe all of this in a very nice, elegant way using the grand canonical ensemble. Uh, and the grand canonical ensemble uh, is something where we allow the particle number to fluctuate by imagining that our system is in thermal equilibrium with some kind of thermal reservoir, or some kind of bath, if you like, whose properties are determined by its chemical potential. So this basically sets the zero energy of our system, the chemical potential. And the number of particles can fluctuate. So in the grand canonical ensemble, Of statistical mechanics, we allow particle number to fluctuate. And we do this by imagining that the system to um, we imagine that we connect the system to uh, a sort of infinite thermal reservoir or bath, as it's often called. <clears throat> and the properties of this bath are determined uh, by the chemical potential. Which is this thing called mu. Okay, so what we can define is a Hamiltonian in the grand canonical ensemble, which is basically the, the actual model Hamiltonian minus the chemical potential times uh, the total number of electrons. And using the grand canonical ensemble, we can easily derive the Fermi Dirac distribution, which tells us about the occupation of, uh, of uh, electronic states of different energies. So consider that we have an electronic state, uh, ket k, with epsilon uh, k as its energy. We have our Hamiltonian here, which is the sum over k of epsilon k times n k hat. And this term here is the sum over k uh, of n k hat times a constant energy shift, which is the chemical potential mu. And so this whole thing is basically the sum over k of epsilon k minus mu times n k hat. So this is what I meant when I said that the chemical potential is basically like an energy shift of the single particle levels. Okay, um, so what we want to know is, to, to work out the Fermi-Dirac distribution, is the average occupation of a, a state with a given energy. So how do we do this? Let's first consider a simple Hamiltonian uh, which just consists of this single state um, k. Uh, so we've just got ep the Hamiltonian is just epsilon k times the occupation uh, operator, the number operator n k hat. So we're not considering 
a many body system with lots of states, we're just considering this, this one state. Then we ask ourselves, what is the average occupation? So we use the machinery of statistical mechanics to work out the expectation value of the operator n k hat. That's equal to the trace of the density matrix times n k over the trace of the density matrix, um, as we looked at in a previous lecture. Um, but this is a very simple system, and we can just evaluate this by hand. Um, we have two different possibilities for the state um, uh, k. It can either be empty or occupied. And the uh, so we have the uh, eigenvalue of the operator n k multiplied by the Boltzmann factor e to the minus beta and times the energy. Beta is the inverse temperature 1 over kt. The energy is nk times the single particle energy epsilon k. And then because we imagine that the system is connected to a thermal reservoir, uh, we minus, we subtract from that, minus beta, uh, sorry, minus mu nk. Uh, good. And then that whole thing is divided by the partition function, which is the same thing, uh, but without multiplying these Boltzmann weights uh, by the nk eigenvalues. Okay, so we have something that looks a bit like this, uh, which we can just go ahead and evaluate. Uh, for nk is equal to 0, we get 0 on the top. For nk is equal to 1, we get the Boltzmann weight e to, to the minus beta uh, epsilon k minus mu. And on the bottom, we get almost the same thing, except we get a 1 because it's e to the 0. 1 plus e to the minus beta epsilon k minus mu. We can um, divide top and bottom by e to the minus beta epsilon k minus mu and obtain the result that the average occupation is 1 over 1 plus e to the plus beta epsilon k minus mu. And this thing is called the Fermi function. And it's evaluated at an energy epsilon k. Okay, this was um, for a Hamiltonian that consisted of a single site. And so you might be wondering um, what about the energy, the uh, occupation uh, of a site uh, at a given energy in a many-body system. That's what we're really interested in. And we'll see that actually it's the same. It's the same because we have a diagonal representation of the Hamiltonian uh, in the single particle basis. Uh, where the different orbitals don't talk to each other, so they're kind of independent. The occupation of a given orbital nj is independent from the occupation of a given orbital nk, and that occupation is given by the Fermi function. Okay, so let's just uh, go ahead and do the calculation. Imagine that we have a many-body uh, system with, let's say, m sites or m orbitals. And this m can even go to infinity. We're not, uh, uh, we don't need to specify it exactly. Let's say that we have a diagonal representation of the Hamiltonian, which is the sum over k of single particle energy levels epsilon k times the number of electrons occupying that particular orbital now we'll write down many particle eigenstates 
rather than single particle orbitals. So many particle eigenstates of H uh, are denoted, let's say, uh, ket i. And these are defined such that H acting on i gives me e i times the state back again. And um, here we know because of the diagonal form that um, we can write these eigenstates i in the occupation of basis n1, n2, n3, and so on, all up to nm for our m orbital system. However, we need to label each of these occupation numbers uh, by the state label. So this eigenstate i has a particular configuration of occupation numbers. If I consider a different eigenstate, uh, i primed, I might have a different set of uh, occupation numbers. So I need to label these occupation numbers by the particular state that we're looking at. So we'll put a superscript i on all of these occupation numbers to remind us that these are the occupation numbers that are specific to the eigenstate i. OK, very good. Uh, what is the energy of that state? Uh, the energy of eigenstate i is ei. And that's going to be the sum over k of the single particle energies epsilon k times the occupation numbers nk in this particular state. So I, again, have to use this superscript i in here. Finally, we know that the total number of electrons in this state ni is equal to the sum over k of nk in the state i. Okay, good. So what we want to know is the average occupation of a given orbital. Let's call it orbital j. And so what we want to know is the expectation value n j. We use the machinery of statistical mechanics as usual to do this for us. How? Well, we write that n j, the expectation value, is equal to the sum over different eigenstates i of n j in state i, and then e to the minus beta, um, and then it's e i minus mu n i. And that's, then we divide this by the partition function, which is the same thing, but without the weightings from uh, the n j i's. And just remember that uh, this sum over i here is the sum over all states. Um, beta, as usual, is the inverse temperature uh, 1 over kT. Okay, so um, we can actually expand this out a little bit because we can enumerate the eigenstates in the occupation number basis as shown over here. We know what the eigenstates are, and we can enumerate all possible states just by summing over, first of all, 0, 1 for the value of n1, 0, 1 for the value of n2, 0, 1 for the value of n3, and so on. So um, we can express this occupation number in this, something that looks a little bit messy, but let's just write it out. It's, first of all, let's sum over the different possibilities for n1, sum over the different possibilities for n2, for n3, and so on. Eventually, we encounter nj, and j is, of course, the sites that we're interested in finding the occupation of. And then we go all the way up to nm for m sites in the system. And then, 
what do we actually compute? We compute n, j, there's no i label now because we're summing over all the possible states, e to the minus beta, and then we need to have the energy here, and the energy is, as shown, uh, this object, which involves the sum of these occupation numbers. So we have e to the minus beta, and then the sum upon k of epsilon k minus mu times n k. And this n k is one of the n's that is being summed over. Okay, so that indeed looks a little bit messy. We're not even finished yet. We've got to divide by the partition function, which is almost exactly the same expression. except that we just don't have this, um, this nj on the top. We instead just normalize according to the Boltzmann weights themselves. Okay, very good. And this looks actually um, horrendously messy, uh, but it's not as bad as it looks because I can actually factorize quite a bit out of this expression. For example, here I have uh, nj appearing, and that's just one of the terms in this many uh, concatenated bunch of sums here. And nj can take the value of uh, 0 or 1 only. If nj is equal to 0, then the whole thing is equal to 0. The whole sum is equal to 0. If nj is equal to 1, then it's rather simple. So we can um, make life a little bit easier for ourselves by factorizing out from this expression the term involving nj. And that is going to give us the following expression. So I'm going to factorize out a term uh, e to the minus beta epsilon j minus mu, and that's when nj is equal to 1. When nj is equal to 0, the whole thing is 0, so that, that part of the sum drops out. And then uh, on the top, the rest, so that's a factor that's common to everything. And then I'm going to have n1, the sum over n2, the sum over n3, all the way up to the sum over nm. Noting that here, I'm not including the sum over uh, nj, because I did that already. I did that explicitly by taking this term out of the whole thing as a common factor. Um, so then, because I took that out as a factor, I just have e to the minus, let me go back uh, in color, to the blue, I have uh, e to the minus beta, the sum over k of epsilon k minus mu of n k. Um, but because I took out the nj factor, I have to restrict this sum. Let me put this little primed here, meaning I'm not summing over the, uh, also not summing over nj in that term. Okay, that's fine. What about downstairs? I have the partition function, um, and I can again factorize out the term involving nj, but here I have um, no nj factor out the front, so I'm going to get an overall factor of 1 plus e to the minus beta ej minus mu. And then I have the same bunch of sums and so on. Um, and everything else is uh, exactly the same. And the important thing to note is that almost everything here cancels. All of this stuff here cancels with all of this stuff here, and we're just left with this piece. And that piece uh, is exactly what we want. We have that the expectation value of a state, j, 
J, or the expectation value of the occupation of a state J is given just by E to the minus beta epsilon J minus mu over 1 plus E to the minus beta epsilon J minus mu. And again, with a bit of algebraic rearrangement, we can write this as 1 over 1 plus e to the plus beta epsilon j minus mu. And this is exactly the Fermi function for um, our state epsilon with energy epsilon j. And in fact, we can consider an arbitrary many-body system with any number of orbitals we like or any energy that we like. In fact, the energy could form a continuum and we can look at the occupation of any given level in this continuum. And so finally, we can just say that this is actually a function, a distribution, one over one plus e to the beta epsilon minus mu for any epsilon. And this is the Fermi Dirac distribution. And again, what we've shown here, that the occupation of any arbitrary state of any energy epsilon in the equilibrium many body system is given by the Fermi Dirac distribution. And how does it look? Well, let's plot the Fermi Dirac distribution, which is the occupation of a given quantum state at energy epsilon. And uh, noting that beta is, of course, 1 over kBt, we can say, let's have a look at this energy scale epsilon. Let's have a look on the scale of energy mu, which is the chemical potential. If um, we're at uh, very, very cold temperatures, so T going to zero in blue, then I see something that's almost like a step function. It's one, and then it collapses basically to zero around the chemical potential. Why? because if the temperature is uh, going to zero, then if I have energies that are below the chemical potential, epsilon minus mu is uh, negative, then, um, and the temperature is going to zero, then I have something negative divided by something very small, which is something very large and negative. E to the, that, that thing is um, then very, very small, and I have 1 over 1, which is equal to 1. We have the, the complete perfect occupation of all such states. Whereas if I have uh, energies above the chemical potential, epsilon minus mu is positive. And when I divide by the temperature and send the temperature to zero, that becomes a very large number. And so um, e to the something large and positive um, is something very large, and so 1 over that thing is very small. So I basically have a step function as t goes to 0. However, at finite temperature, um, this thing gets broadened out a bit. So at higher temperatures, I see something that starts off at 1 like this, uh, but then sort of bleaches out a little bit, and I see some probability that um, uh, some of the states below the chemical potential are unoccupied, and some probability that the states above the chemical potential are occupied. So this shows you the effect of the temperature is to sort of blur out this distinction between states being perfectly occupied or perfectly unoccupied. We get fluctuations in the occupation number uh, thermally, uh, and we really see this from the statistical mechanics. And this is precisely the information that is contained within the Fermi-Dirac distribution. So, so far we've looked at the uh, free electron gas, which basically consists of a bunch of quantum orbitals, all with different uh, single particle energies. 
These can basically be thought of as uh, the potential energy of the different quantum orbitals. However, such a system does not allow the electrons to move around. Each electron occupies its own quantum orbital. There's, we've not yet allowed for any quantum tunneling between different orbitals. We want to be able to give the electrons some kinetic energy as well. And that um, uh, means that we should consider a slightly more uh, microscopic and fundamental model. Um, and this is the second kind of model Hamiltonian that I want to consider in this lecture. And these are called tight binding models. And the kind of Hamiltonian we get will have a potential term and a kinetic energy term. The potential term is like the one we've just been studying. Uh, and the kinetic energy will allow for quantum tunneling between orbitals. Let me write down the Hamiltonian, and then we can discuss some of the terms in there. So we'll have a term that involves the potential energy, as before, the sum over different orbitals i. Each of those orbitals i has an energy epsilon i. And then in the energy of the system, we have to count the number of electrons in that site. So here we had the, the number op operator ni before. Here I'm just writing it out as ci dagger ci. That is a potential energy term. Okay, good. Uh, but we want to add in the kinetic energy term, and how might that look? We have the sum over sites i and j with some quantum tunneling matrix element t i j t for tunneling and then c i dagger c j and this term is a kinetic energy term uh, which is to do with the quantum tunneling uh, between orbitals i and j. And this uh, tij is um, the so-called uh, tunneling matrix element It tells you what the strength of the tunneling is. What's the energy associated with that? We can understand it as a tunneling matrix element from the following. Let's consider um, single particle states What do I mean by single particle states? I mean states that just contain a single particle. For example, Consider a state I'll label ket j, which is obtained from the vacuum by creating uh, an electron in orbital j, like so. We can see that tij is a tunneling matrix element by considering the following object. What is the matrix element of the Hamiltonian uh, between a single particle state j and a single particle state i. If I act with the Hamiltonian on the single particle state j, then there is a term in the Hamiltonian from here which destroys that particle in state j, that's the cj annihilation operator, and then creates an electron in ci, which creates uh, the single particle state ket i. And then I consider the overlap with that with a state i and the amplitude of that is just the Tij. Okay, so that's the physical meaning of that thing. And it's basically a tunneling rate. There's one other thing that we need to know about this Hamiltonian, which is that the Hamiltonian must be Hermitian.
And the property of it being Hermitian means that h dagger is equal to h. This is required because if you have a Hermitian Hamiltonian, then it will have real eigenvalues. The eigenvalues are the energies, and of course, we want the energies to be real. If the Hamiltonian is Hermitian, that actually places a stringent constraint on the form that it can take. In particular, it's obvious that if I take the dagger of this Hamiltonian, um, the term ci dagger cj is going to turn into cj J dagger ci, and therefore we get the following constraints on the tunneling matrix elements. That's tij is equal to t j i star, the complex conjugate of that thing. Okay, so that's a constraint from it being hermit emission. So let's now consider a simple example. The example is going to be just a two-site system. Let's write down a Hamiltonian. We'll have a single particle energy for orbital 1, which we'll call epsilon 1. And the energy uh, depends on whether or not that, that orbital is occupied. Let's have another energy, epsilon 2, associated with orbital 2, their single particle energies. And this time, we're going to allow <clears throat> electrons to tunnel from orbital 1 to orbital 2 using this term. And you see that I've enforced the hermeticity of the Hamiltonian by factorizing out a common t here for both of these two terms. Um, notice that this term here, uh, C1 dagger C2, corresponding to the tunneling of an electron from 1 to 2, um, is not Hermitian. What I mean is that if I take C1 dagger C2, I take the dagger of this, it does not turn into itself. It gives me C2 dagger C1. So this term is not Hermitian. However, these two terms are Hermitian conjugates. And what that means is that when I take the dagger of one, it turns into the other one. When I take a dagger of the other one, it turns into the first one. So when I take the two together, both Hermitian conjugates, the whole thing is Hermitian. They just turn into each other. Okay, so that's exactly what we wanted. Uh, but of course, for that to work, we also need that this T is real. Okay, but that's not much of a loss of generality. We can also regard this hermeticity property as being like a time reversal symmetry, what we're saying is that the tunneling rate of electrons going from 1 to 2 must be the same as the tunneling from 2 to 1. We're allowing for this microscopic reversibility of electrons going from 1 to 2 or from 2 to 1 with the same amplitude. Fine, so let's now have a look at solving this model, or at least let's see uh, what we get when we consider our usual basis states. So the basis states for this two orbital system will be defined by the occupation numbers, um, n1 and n2, with n1 equals 0 and 1, and n2 equals 0 or 1. Let's have a look at the total electron number uh, 0. This is the vacuum state. If I apply the Hamiltonian to this vacuum state, what do I get? Well, the energy um, associated uh, with the potential on orbital 1 is 0 because there's no electrons in orbital 1, likewise for orbital 2. I also can't tunnel any electrons from 1 to 2 because there aren't any electrons in the system. So the energy of the whole system is just equal to 0. Um, I could write this as an eigenvalue equation, 0 times the state back again. 
um, meaning that I could say that the state 0, 0 is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian with energy 0. It's a bit boring. What about the n equals, let's say the n equals 2 sector. There's another simple one. H acts on the state 1, 1. What do I get in this case? Um, well, there's one electron in orbital 1, so I'm going to pick up a potential energy epsilon 1 from that. There's one electron in orbital 2, so I'm going to pick up an energy epsilon 2 from that. However, I cannot tunnel an electron from 1 to 2 or from 2 to 1, because if I destroy the electron in 2 and then try to create it in orbital 1, there's already an electron in orbital 1, and the maximum number of electrons that can be contained in any quantum orbital, if we're talking about fermions, is 1 by the Pauli principle. So it turns out that this is just going to give me epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 times the state back again. So the state 1, 1 is also an eigenstate. with energy epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2. It's the sum of the single particle energies. So very straightforward. But something uh, different happens when we consider the n equals 1 sector. And we actually have two different states here. Let's have a look at the Hamiltonian acting on the state uh, 0, 1. We have a potential term which is going to give me epsilon 2 times the state 0, 1 back again uh, because there's an electron in orbital 2 but not in orbital 1. Um, but I can also tunnel electron 2 from 2 to 1. Let's just write that out properly. So I get t times c1 dagger c2 times the state 0, 1 which is itself defined as being C2 dagger acting on the vacuum. So I create an electron in the vacuum, then I destroy it, and then I create another electron in orbital 1. And so this is going to be epsilon 2 of the 0, 1 state back again, plus t times the state 1, 0. So that is not an eigenstate. Similarly, if I act with the Hamiltonian on the state 1, 0, I'm going to get epsilon 1 times the state 1, 0 back again, plus tunneling amplitude t times the state 0, 1. So these are not, neither of them are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Uh, one thing you can see already is that they kind of turn into each other when you apply the Hamiltonian. So as we'll see, there's actually a linear combination of 0, 1 and 1, 0 states that will be eigenstates, and they will have definite energies, uh, and they will satisfy the Schrodinger equation. Uh, we'll see how to actually solve the Hamiltonian and work out what the eigenstates are later. What we're doing at this stage is simply looking at the basis states and testing, are they or are they not eigenstates? In fact, we could have argued that the 0, 1, 1, 0 states were not eigenstates of the Hamiltonian ahead of time. Uh, why is that? We know that because the, the occupation numbers n1 and n2 are not good quantum numbers. For this Hamiltonian. Why? 
what do I mean when I say these are not good quantum numbers? It means they are not conserved. How do I know that they're not conserved? Because they don't commute with the Hamiltonian. And of course, that is exactly what we expect physically. The number of electrons in orbital 1 is not conserved because the electron can tunnel from orbital 1 to orbital 2. The number of electrons in orbital 2 is not conserved because the, or the electrons can tunnel between 1 and 2. So we cannot label eigenstates of H according to the individual occupation numbers of the orbitals because those things are not conserved. We can't label eigenstates by those quantum numbers because they're not quantum numbers. However, the total electron number, which is the sum of the individual occupation numbers, is conserved uh, because it does commute with the Hamiltonian. And again, this makes physically good sense because although the electrons are moving around from orbital 1 to orbital 2, they're not being created or destroyed. The charge is indestructible. There's no electrons coming out of, of nowhere or being destroyed. Um, there's a certain number of electrons in the system and then they're conserved. Um, so the total electron number should be conserved and therefore we can label our states according to the total electron number. And in fact, that's why the n equals zero state was an eigenstate, because we can label eigenstates of h according to n, and there was only a single basis state that had n equals zero, and that must therefore be the eigenstate. Likewise, there was only a single basis state with n equals two, and if we can label eigenstates according to n, then that must be an eigenstate. The problem comes when we looked at the n equals one sector, because there we had two basis states, and it, the, the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian could in general be a linear combination of those two things. And later on, that's indeed what we'll see uh, is the case. So the punchline is that uh, general eigenstates of type binding models are linear combinations of the uh, basis states in the occupation number basis. How do we find what these eigenstates are? Well, that, is, of course, is the central problem in many-body quantum mechanics. It's about solving the Schrodinger equation, and that will be the subject of the next lecture.